Fireside Chat Podcast, episode number one, Hockey's Back. Thanks for joining us for the first episode of the Fireside Chat. I'm Dan, alongside my co-hosts Matt and Lucas. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm fired up. Very good. Awesome. Hockey's back. What's not to love, right? Absolutely. Can't wait for the puck to drop. This slush leaves a lot to be desired, though. It's very muddy. Well, guys, we got a lot to talk about with the Flames coming back in the shortened season, so what do you say we jump right into it? You don't want to talk about the slush? I, I think right now with the Flames the way they are, there's probably a lot more to talk about besides the slush. It's Calgary. We're going to have slush for a while. Fair enough. All right. Moving right along. So we got a, we got a new CBA. I'd say ne- neither side really won. What do you guys think? I think both sides lost because really this deal could have been done last year and they just lost millions of dollars trying to settle vendettas. I think. (laughs) I basically feel about the CBA the same way I feel uh, or I felt when I found out Kristen Stewart cheated on Robert Pattinson. I hope it hurt both of them. That's all. I don't care. Hockey's back. I think we know that it's hurt both of them for sure. Good. It was unnecessary. So why don't we jump into some of the changes with the Flames, and I think a great place to start would be the new uh, faces behind the bench. As you guys know, the Flames cleaned house in the offseason, bringing in a whole new coaching staff led by Bob Hartley. What was your guys' thoughts when you heard Bob Hartley announce as head coach? I thought it was a very good selection, actually. Uh, he did, His coaching style is to put uh, more emphasis on a up-tempo all offense all the time kind of game which with Brent Sutter uh, that was not emphasized as much as it could be and one of the things that uh, we saw a lot last year was uh, there was too much space between the defense and the forwards and that was limiting things and there wasn't a lot of cohesion in the team so I'm hoping that Hartley can do things to remedy that and make a five-man unit work cohesively, which I don't think we saw last year at all. (laughs) Lucas, what do you think of Bob Hartley coming on as head coach? Well, when I first heard that he was up for it, I was really against it simply because my last memory of him is uh, as the coach of the Atlanta Thrashers. Then, of course, you do a little digging and you find out Bob Hartley was the coach of the Atlanta Thrashers the last time the Atlanta Thrashers mattered. So, you know, I was uh, on board with it from there. Feaster seems to like him. And I know not a lot or uh, people trust Feaster probably less than I think he deserves. But Feaster trusts him. So, you know, good luck. What I thought was interesting, too, is for the first time in, I think, as long as I can remember, the whole coaching staff was cleaned out. Like, it wasn't like when Brent came in and inherited Daryl's coaching staff. It was a brand new staff from top to bottom, which I really think is going to help as well. Except Malarchuk. True. Yeah, the goalie coach stayed. Well, they they only deal with the goalies, so that's not the same, really, because it's just Kipper, basically. But, uh, no, like, with... Getting Jelena and Jacques Cloutier in there, it, they'll have different opinions on how the team should be run, and I think with the personnel the Flames have, they needed a different identity from the one that Brent was trying to force onto them last well, year. Well, also, just from a perspective of a team hasn't made the playoffs for three years, of course you have to change things up. It uh, You don't have the luxury of keeping assistant coaches or certain guys on staff that you may like or maybe decent enough per- people but they aren't getting the job done so it's time for new blood that's very true you know and i think the thing a lot of people don't remember about bob hartley is he did lead a stanley cup winning team i mean he was the avalanche coach for a long time when that team was successful so he knows what it takes to take a team all the way 
Well, uh, Alex Tange actually, uh, during the off season when they were doing the coaching search, uh, he actually reached out to Hartley to convince him that like the Flames weren't as bad as they were on paper. <laughs> so, you know, it, it seems that he has some support from the players right from the get go, which I don't know as if Sutter had that. When he came on? Because Tange is a fan of his too, I think Tange was a question mark for a lot of people coming into this season. And my personal thought was because he now has the coach that he really wants, it's going to really help the Flames to get them get more out of Tange than they may have. I suppose. I mean, I don't think anyone before was clamoring for Brent Sutter, at least anyone on the roster. Like, I don't think Aginlo was sitting at home in BC going, you know what we really need? Someone who's grumpy. <laughs> Someone who makes things less fun. Yeah. I, I really think we've been having too much fun of late, and it needs to stop. <laughs> I think for a lot of people, though, Sutter was more of the same, right? Because he inherited the job from his brother. So there wasn't that big shakeup there. It was just more of the same, more grumpy Sutters. No, he, he took over for Keenan. Well, same general... Like, Everyone says that, but Mike Keenan was very, very happy his time here. He 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 had a lot of he had a lot of time yeah. to grin, a lot of time to comb those same seven hairs in exactly the right spot. Um, <laughs> he he was not Iron Mike. He was Vacation Mike. Yeah, and I don't want to get into it tonight, but I still wonder how much of Keenan during Calgary was Mike Keenan and how much he was a puppet of Daryl Sutter's. I am also kind of wondering that, but like with uh, what Luke was saying, like it wasn't really a whole regime change, even from Keenan to Sutter, because like you still had Daryl upstairs, and you know. He was still driving the train, <laughs> so... Well, and there have been stories about just how much Daryl was trying to coach this team, even when he was a GM. I mean, there's stories of him telling Brent who to sit and who not to sit for a game and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that no matter who the coach was when Daryl was GM, Daryl was really calling the shots. Yeah, well, I mean, he's sort of, you know, King Daryl at, at that point. But uh, what are you going to do? We were talking about new coaches, right? Congratulations to Daryl Sutter on a championship. He earned it. He did. Uh, yeah. I was glad to see that. Speaking of new faces in the behind the bench, why don't we talk about some of the new faces that we're going to see on the ice this year? I think there's three big names that are coming into the Flames, or names that could potentially be big. And the first one is uh, Yari Hudler. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, and uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that uh, his father passed away, I believe, last night. So... Oh, really? Yes, uh, condolences to Mr. Hoodler. To the whole family. He was acquired by the Flames as a free agent. I think he was our first real free agent signing after the first. And he signed a $16 million deal over four years, which averages out to about $4 million a year for the cap hit. I think uh, how he'll fit into the Flames is somewhat taking the job that Rene Bork had in providing a good secondary offensive presence without having to be the guy, which I think we were kind of lacking once uh, we traded him for Camilleri. So, you know, it, depth always helps. T to be fair, we were lacking Rene Bork's presence when Rene Bork was here. True. <laughs> That is a very underrated trade just due to getting rid of the 3.3 million cap hit for the next four years from for Bork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we got a guy who was a cancer because he had the audacity to want to win. How dare he? Mike Camilleri, you should apologize. Yeah. F fist in the air. How could you? <laughs> Well, to me, I mean, the, the hidden piece of that whole Camilleri deal that everybody overlooks is Kerry Ramo. And I really think that could be what, when we look back at this trade in a few years, people say, you know what, the Flames really got the better of the deal because of Ramo. I think as soon as you got rid of Bork for Camilleri, like, you win the trade walking away. And the fact that you could get a potential number one out of it as well, um, that trade is a fireable offense for Pierre Gauthier. And not surprisingly, he's fired. But... Uh... 
Yeah, that yeah. that is. It's not as bad as the FNUF trade because not as many pieces were exchanged. But in terms of value and actual re- asset mismanagement, it's in the conversation. Did you guys hear the story about Goche and uh, Camilleri's jersey after that trade? Yeah, where he would like was holding it hostage for money. <laughs> yeah, they they pulled Camilleri off the ice when the trade was made, so he wouldn't get hurt before it cleared with the office. And uh, Cammy asked if he could keep his jersey because he collects all his jerseys. And instead of just giving it to him, they said, oh, we'll sell it to you for whatever the price is we normally sell a game-worn jersey for online. So they want like 1200 bucks from the player for his own jersey. <sighs> Lay sigh. What a way to go out. More so for Goche than Camilleri, I would think. That's his legacy. Does he have a job? No. Oh, Deservedly good. so. <laughs> Not a hockey job, anyways. Yeah. I'm sure he'll be... An, I'm sure he's an excellent lawyer. <laughs> So the, the next big free agent, the one people were talking about, was Roman Cervenka. And he came in as a free agent from Russia. He's on a one-year deal for nine seventy-five, dollars um, And his cap hit could actually total up to 3.75 with bonuses. So quite a big cap hit there. If he wins the Hart Trophy, leads the team in scoring, a Conn Smythe, etc. He's not going to hit them. He's got the same bonuses and escalators in his claws that Jonathan Taves has, so... I, I would love it if he had to pay if we had to pay him, but I don't see it. Yeah, well, plus that uh, he's out for three weeks, uh, give or take, because of the blood thinners that he had to do to remedy the blood clot he suffered. Oh, was he actually? Do we actually have a timetable for him? Now? Uh, it's a rough timeline because, like, it they they were saying that uh, the pills that uh, it was like a it would need another week or so and then to actually get into game shape after that that i'm just estimating but it's probably going to be in that time frame see calgary this is the sort of research and preparation you can expect from us every week so come back (laughs) yeah last i heard um he had to go see a doctor in the states about his blood clots and just making sure everything was okay but jay feaster was saying that the medication they have him on you can't just stop the medication even though the blood clots go away you have to finish the entire dosage yeah otherwise they come back stronger yeah i'm not sure that's an antibiotics joke it's it's okay but you know even if he's out for the first what week and a half of the season i think it's not going to be that bad i mean even with the shortened season i think he can still slot in a week and a half later and make an impact on the team yeah, I think so, just because he's been playing all year. Yeah. More or less. Where do you guys find think Cervenka finds himself on the roster? Do you think he's on a line with Hudler? Yeah, I a second or third line for sure. And are either of those guys are either of those guys natural centers or are they both wingers? H- Hoodler's a natural center. Or sorry, not Hoodler. Cervenka's a natural center. Um and I would not be surprised to see him on the top line if he's as advertised because I don't think uh Alex Tange is going to play center for the entire year. Uh there there's a you know there's a reason he hasn't done it for 12 years. Well based on what Hartley's been saying is if you're playing well you're going to get top line minutes. If you're not you won't. So I think we're going to see the lines moving around a lot more than we have in the past. Which that's good. <laughs> Well, I mean, especially considering Jerome McGinley shouldn't be the only first-line option, or at least the default first-line option anymore. He should have to earn it just as anyone else should. I agree. Based on the last two seasons he's had. Or at least the last season, because didn't he go 65 or something, 80, 82 or whatever, and then back down to the For games played or for points? No, 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 for points. I'm not sure. I think so. I'll uh, I'll have a look. Keep talking amongst yourselves. I really think that part of it was Hoodler was brought in because he's a f- I think he's a friend of Cervanka's, if I remember correctly. They've played together in the past. There's some connection there. I don't think he's a bad signing, but I think because there is that chemistry, the team's going to be smart to put them together yeah. at least at the beginning. That's why, like, I think uh, the Flames would be good to take one of like the three big names and Camilleri, Tangi, and Aginla and put them on the line with. Hoodler and Cervenka, just to give both spread out the offense and to give legitimacy to each line. Mm-hmm. 
So if they if they don't do that, like I don't think that would be the default line pairing. Who else do you think they might pair with Servanka and Hoodler? Well, you could go with yeah, Glenn Cross, possibly Berchi, depending Glenn Cross. on how they feel he w- he would fit with them. Well, if you listen to the reports out of camp, uh, Berchi is right now playing on a line with Camilleri and Backland, and they're looking quite prolific. But who knows? Yeah, I had two thoughts for who I'd put on that line if it wasn't one of the top three. I was thinking Hoodler, Cervenka, and uh, Glenn Cross would be a natural pairing. But I could also see putting Hoodler, Cervenka, and Como on a line, and I think that might be an interesting pairing. Uh, I would, if Como earns it, by all means, go for it. But I am more than, I've, I've seen what happens when Blake Como gets more than his deserved nine minutes a night. Well, Como seems to have Sean Donovan syndrome, where when he's good, he's really good, and when he's bad, you know, he shouldn't get more than fourth-line minutes. So, you know, it it just depends on what Como you're getting. Because, like, if you're... Because when you're getting, uh, like, Como back when he was with the Islanders, like, he was a 25-goal guy. So... It really depends on which one you get, one you're getting. Well, it's funny you mentioned that too, Matt, because I remember when he got put on waivers and we picked him up. Everyone I knew was saying, "Oh, this guy's good," and I said, "You know what? He wouldn't be on waivers if he wasn't flawed somehow." And now we're starting to see those flaws in him. Well, if we can get the Blake Como that plays with John Tavares, then we're good. Otherwise, I think we've got a guy who's a fourth liner who's got some physical skills who played with John Tavares. Like, go back and look at all those. 30 goal scorers who played with the Sedins before they finally settled on Burroughs. True. True. He's, he is what he is. And uh, if, you know, again, if he earns it, more power to him. He could... Oh, yeah. Like, I'm not saying, like, give it to him, but it wouldn't shock me if he did. But he would have to earn it. For sure. And the last guy we brought in the offseason was Dennis Weidman, and that he was acquired from the Capitals in a trade essentially for a 2013 fifth-round pick. And the Flames had to throw in Jordan Henry because they had too many contracts. So Washington had to take a contract back that was expiring on July 1st, which I found interesting when that came out. It was generous of them. Well, it was expiring in like a week anyways. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think of Weidman? I like him. If you're not expecting him to be a number one defenseman, then, you know, he'll meet expectations. But if you think he's going to be the first pairing go-to guy kind of thing, then, you know, people might start uh, pigeonholing him like they did Bomeister. So he's not going to play 25 minutes a game, but he will get ice time on the power play he'll get points and he'll be steady in his own end he does have a big contract he's coming in at 26.25 million over four years which is five years five and a quarter a year so i really think the fans here are going to be expecting something from him for that money they're gonna they're gonna be expecting points and as long as he puts up 40 to 45 points a year 10 plus goals then everyone's gonna be happy yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, you, you know, he's not going to be a, a Raman Regeer type defenseman or anything like that. He'll just be steady. But as long as he gets his power play time and puts up the points, then that's what you should expect. But expecting him to be a number one guy, it's a little unrealistic for him. I don't think anyone's expecting him to be a number one, though. I mean, imagine if Anton Babchuk was a consistent hockey player and several inches shorter. Then you'd get Dennis Weidman. I think Weidman's a solid number three who can jump up to a number two in injury situations. He's yeah. fine. I like him. Three, four guy. Don't put him in shootouts. He's, he's, he's going to go flying off into the corner. Or maybe you should put him in the shootout. <laughs> it would be entertaining. It would be. I'm just looking at the roster here, and it looks like is going to be wearing jersey number 10 this year. Um, Hoodler's going to be wearing 24, which I don't think anyone's worn since Conroy left. And Weidman will be wearing 26. When was the last time we had a good player wear number 10? Roberts. I'm looking at the list of all-time number 10s here. Um, yeah, probably Gary Roberts. Since Roberts left, we had Lowry, Amante, McGratton, and Hagman who wore it. So, it's, yeah, it's got to be Roberts. 
All right. Well, Cervenka, I think almost by default, assume it becomes the best 10 we've had since Roberts. At least the person I expect the most of. I'm looking at number 26, and that's been a number that has gone to a bunch of journeymen. So hopefully yeah. it's not. we don't feel the same way about uh, Weidman after this. Beijing, Total Travis week. Brigley, Chris Clark, Dallas Eakin, Steve Beijing again, Josh Green, Nielsen, Nylander, Ladislav Kahn. Bunch of guys nobody remembers. Cole leak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but 26 isn't quite, like, 10 is one digit removed from single digits. It's an important number. It's one that everyone has. I don't know. You just I, I'm a stickler when it comes to numbers. And uh, if it were up to me, Blair Jones would not be wearing number 19. 19 is a number deserved for impact players. Sackick, Iserman, Taves. Even Doan, if you want to go that far. Thornton, Spezza. Good players wear number 19. If, you're, if you have a 19 on your team who's a scrub, you're probably a scrub team. Matt, I've totally forgot the code leak had worn it. And it's funny, if you look at the Flames website with the all-time jersey numbers, they don't even have code leak on there. So I think they <laughs> won't even forget that he ever played for this team. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> They've got Steve Steos on the list for 27, but not Code Leak for 26. So they're okay remembering Steos played here, but they want to totally forget that Code Leak was over here. I think we all do. <laughs> I think we all have. <laughs> True. Until Matt brought it up, I had forgotten he played here. Well, we're talking about players in. Let's talk about the two players that we lost, I think, are going to be the names that people will know. One is David Moss, who went to Phoenix, and the other is Ole Jokinen, who went to Winnipeg. Any thoughts on those two gentlemen? I'm sure going to miss David Moss for the 60 games he plays and the 20 games in which he contributes. Who's going to keep the press box warm without David Moss? Babchuk? I don't know. We'll see. I was surprised David Moss got a $2.1 million a year contract in Phoenix. Gotta get to that cap floor, Dan. It's true. Especially if you want revenue sharing dollars. I don't know if that's how it works. Please don't send emails. Matt, any thoughts on Jokin and Moss leaving? You gonna miss either one? Well, for on-ice play, we'll likely miss Jokinen, but for off-ice, probably won't miss either of them. I don't know how much you can miss a guy who was your number one center on the way to three ninth place finishes. Yeah, he puts up 60 points a year. Good for him. I'm sure, and I don't dislike Jokinen particularly, but... I think Jokinen was the right guy on the wrong spot on the depth chart. I think he could have been a good second or third centerman. I don't think he was the right guy for the number one center. Well, I mean, he was still the best... Yeah, but that goes to overall talent on the Flames, and we don't have any centers at the moment so like even now our best natural center is probably a tie between Backlund and Stajan so you know kind of an issue yeah uh, and going back to way back to what you said earlier about Bob Hartley knowing what it takes to win I mean five Hall of Famers at least were on his team when he won a Stanley Cup so two Hall of Fame centers that's what we need we may have drafted one this year, who knows, but we're still one Hall of Fame center short. And uh, until we've got, you know, it, it's pretty obvious, I think, to everyone at this point that two elite centers are mandatory if you have aspirations of competing for a championship. Uh, maybe we, maybe Cervenka is one of them. Probably not, but... Oh. So that brings me to my next thought, which is, you know, we're talking about the the hole that I think we all still see at center. I think they've shored up a lot in the offseason, but there's a hole at center. Do you guys think the Flames did enough during UFA season to improve the roster the way they needed to? Really, the only guy they brought in was Hoodler in the UFA season. Well, really, they didn't have any holes that would, would have been filled by someone better in the UFA group. Like, the top center available in the free agent market, I believe, was Jokinen. And then it was, like, Jason Arnott or, you know, someone like that. Like, there's not really too many options out there. There definitely wasn't a Brad Richards where you could say, oh, well, we should go for that guy this year. And, like, we already have too many wingers that we're moving them to center. So... <laughs> 
I don't think we really had any need for anybody else. I, uh, yeah, I think this is probably, not even probably, this is, in my estimation, the most talented team the Flames have put on the ice since 2008-2009. I think that is uh, very difficult to argue, especially when you factor in Berchi in addition to the three guys they brought in through free agency. Um, Is that going to be enough? It depends on the mental will of this team basically because talent wise there are six to eight i think but are they mentally strong enough to do what needs to be done and you can have all the talent in the world like the atlanta thrashers had three 90 point players one year and missed the playoffs so as much as I, i think the influx of skill gives us a better shot than last year's team for sure uh but I don't know the mental makeup of this team yet. I think we have to see what Hartley is going to do with these guys, too. I think that in the NHL, you can't... As you said, it's not just about having skilled players on the ice, and I think a lot of that mental makeup starts well, with the, the office. coaching staff implements a system that's more tailored to the player's skill set than the Flames should perform better instead of trying to get the players to conform to something that they're not. So maybe by playing a more offensively liberal game that they'll have more success with that than playing a defense first game and being a little constrained by that like they were last year. Yeah, I'm glad that the Flames... um... I think have the right coaching staff, the guy that's going to work with this team and make a... A playbook that works with the guys he's got. I felt like with Brent Sutter, he came in with a predefined notion of what his team's going to be, and you had to conf- you had to conform to that. And I think that Hartley's willing to look at all the options and say, what can I do with the pieces I've got? Yeah, because like if you look at the Flames forward group, there's no... Like, other than Glenn Cross and the, the, a few of the fourth liners, there's nobody that you can say, that guy's really good defensively. So if you're have like say like again like he's not great defensively so you're not going to see results that are really good if you try to make him play really good defensively cuz that's not what he is he's a goal scorer so try to formulate the system to enhance his good assets which is scoring goals so i'm hoping that Hartley can devise a system that enhances that See, if Jerome McGinley were even three years younger, I'd start it, I'd have him killing penalties again. Oh yeah, I agree. He, he used to. I don't like. I'm sure he's he's lost a little bit of his burst, so probably not the best situation at this point. But th- there was a time when you know he was as deadly as anyone to just have it hit his shin pads, blow past the defender, score a shorthanded goal. Oh yeah. Um and. I think out of all of our penalty killers, you know, th- th- that element seems seemed to have really been lacking in the last couple of years. There was very little aggression on the penalty kill. I think there's a chance for the Flames, too, to realize that Jerome is aging. And I didn't always get that sense from the last coaching staff. They still thought Jerome was Superman. And I think this is a chance for them to say, like you said, he's aging. He's not as good at some things as he used to be. So we need to find somebody to jump in on those spots. <laughs> And I mean, my th- my thinking is, like, you can be responsible defensively. That That's ultimately what you need. You don't need to be a defensive specialist. You just need to know what your responsibility is. Take your man. If you're a winger, watch, your, watch the point man. Uh, whatever. Just cover your bases. And then, honestly, the best defense is having the puck. I understand that dump and chase has its place, but I cannot stand constantly just getting over the red line, dumping it in, because it's hard to get the puck back. Don't just give it away. I hate watching teams just surrender it. It is infuriating. And it's ha- it happened too much in the last three years, and I hope we see a lot more puck possession, because we've got guys who can hold on to it. Put the puck into spaces and move around and make some stuff happen. We're not asking a lot. One of the things I was somewhat disappointed in is that we didn't get a defensive or a face-off specialist 
like, uh, someone like a Paul Gostad who can just win, like, 55-60% of the draws. Because the Flames are more suited for, like, the Detroit Red Wings puck possession, you know, and hold it type game. But if you're only winning, like, 45% of the faceoffs, you're constantly having to go and get the puck. And that just burns time. So, like, if you're, yeah, and, like, it, you know, like, if it takes you 15 seconds to get the puck after the face-off, well, your shift's only 35 to 40 seconds, so, like, you've already burned half of it just getting the puck. So, like, that was one area that I thought they could have went and got at least one person to get that specialized in that, but... Hopefully... Do either of you guys know what Cervanka's face-off win percent has been like? Well, the thing is, is that uh, he, I think he was around 55% overseas, but Stajan, when he was with the Leafs, he had like a 56-58% winning percentage, and he came here and it dropped right off the cliff. So, you know, it's... They have to really look into that to try and improve. So at least, even if it's just 50-50, you know, <laughs> it'll be a, an improvement. <laughs> I think if you can get a lot of guys who can get over 50, you might not have that one specialist. But if you can get two or three guys who are getting 50 to 60%, that's really going to help too. Mm -hmm. no, no argument from me. Jumping into training camp, which is this week, as we all know, the Flames are busy holding their training camp, their one-week camp that all the teams are doing. Um, two questions I had that I wanted to pose to you guys. Do you think Sven Barchi makes the team out of camp? Definitely. Obviously. Without question. Yeah. I would actually be shocked if he wasn't on the team day one. Kerr and Walker were talking this morning. Uh, Sven Barchi the, was the best player at the scrimmage yesterday. Um, and oddly enough, Stajan apparently had a good game, had a nice goal, good on face-offs, good in, the, in his own zone. Is there anyone else trying out that you guys think is going to steal a job this year? Winchester could. Possum? Yeah, Winchester, that's who I was going to say. It, it really depends, because we, with the fourth line, you could have Jackman not, you know, because he wasn't particularly effective last year, so, you know that job's kind of ripe for the picking, so it just depends. I'd like to see Kalano stay on the roster as the 13th forward. I think he's the right guy for that job. Really? Uh, he was actually just wavered today. Oh, was he? Along with, uh, yeah, with uh, Ben Walter, Joe Piscola, and Akima Lou. So Truthfully, I cannot stand Chris Kalanos. I think he is... He is not an NHL player. He's 31, 32 years old. And in his time up here last year, I mean, he earned his call up. And when he was here, he didn't belong here. He is a journeyman AHL player. And there's nothing wrong with that. He serves a role within the organization. But he is, uh, he does not serve a role on an NHL roster, I don't see. I can't see Kalanos or Piscola getting claimed, but I can see a Lou perhaps getting claimed on waivers. He's he's been injured all year and yeah. But if you're a team that has an extra contract spot, why not take a chance on him? Well, because what's he gonna what what is Akeem Alou gonna do that probably two other guys in your own system couldn't do? Yeah, like he his upside's more a third fourth line forward. So and those guys are mostly interchangeable, and most teams already have five or six guys on their farm team that could jump into those spots. So. Yeah, it would be one thing if he had, like, 20 goal upside, but, you know, no. <laughs> do, you, do you remember when everyone talked about how, oh, our, we draft for, you know, grit and third and fourth liners and blah, blah, blah. Do you ever actually remember a third liner or fourth liner that we've drafted since 2004 coming in and playing for more than a handful of games? No, because... <laughs> Selecting players with limited upside tends to get you bus, and yeah, basically how would, how would Shocking. you say if you get guys with skill, they can learn how to be your good third fourth line types. Like even like a guy like Wayne Primo, who was fairly solid as a fourth liner, he was the first first round draft pick and like seventeenth overall his draft year, so. You know, like, you can 
have skill and then learn like if your skills don't develop as you know you're hoping to be like your first line forward you can learn to be a fourth liner but if you're trying to hope to put everything together to be a third or fourth liner that's not gonna really bear a lot of fruit <laughs> if you can't assert yourself in junior and take minutes away from other guys who you know are still developing and who whatever who you should if you're an nhl player you should be able to beat out you you have no future in the nhl and ugh, rough drafting okay with the cap going down next year i think you're going to see a lot more of this where you'll have kind of rental or temporary third and fourth line guys guys they'll come up and play a handful and then replace them with somebody else said so you're never tying somebody in long term for those roles and that way it's much cheaper yeah i think what you'll end up seeing is a lot less of uh the long term like four year 1.6 million dollar deal to your fighters and that and that'll basically just be league minimum one or two year deal and that's it yeah, I think teams are going to structure around a top six forward core and a top three defensive core, and the rest are just kind of filler pieces that are cheap. Yeah, whether that's a rookie like Berchi or a guy on a low-end second-year contract like a Backlund or just a rent-a-player, it, you know, it'll depend on the team. But yeah, I definitely see them putting more emphasis on your top six guys how happy is Brandon Price that he went to a team that has Scott Gomez and Thomas Coverley? He he's not <laughs> he, he's barely the bronze medal for worst contract on his team. He, he, if Brandon Press played on if, if Brandon Press signed with Calgary, we'd buy him out next year. Brandon Press in this economic reality is not worth 2.5 million dollars a year. So, um, with training camp in mind, who do you guys think gets the backup goaltending job this year? Do you think Carlson keeps it, or does it go to Ir Irving? No, no, definitely not. I think Henrik gets it. Well, I read some stuff today about from training camp. Irving didn't look good. He hasn't uh, been able to get any playing time in Abbotsford, and I understand that he's been on pro tryouts, and he's got a limited amount of games he can play, but... I am a huge believer in the notion that uh, your backup goaltenders, they've got to, goaltenders in general, I mean, just be undeniable. Get the job. And if, if there is a question, trust me, you can be replaced. So either make it not a question or get out of the way. And Henrik Carlson, by all accounts, uh, has performed better. And maybe it was just in the stuff I read specifically seem to deal with more shootouts than anything, but I don't think uh, Leland Irving is making this team. Both our backups, both Carlson and Irving, are on one-year deals, too, so it's not like the Flames have a lot invested in one guy or the other at this point. Yeah, and, and Irving is an old regime's draft pick, so in as much as he is your property, I don't see Feaster having too much loyalty to either guy. Now, if neither one of them gets it done, then by all means, bring up sign Barry Brust. I don't care. Um, but get a backup goalie because there's a lot of back-to-backs, condensed schedule, and you're going to need to rest uh, your number one a little bit if you want to get into the playoffs for one and have any chance of doing some damage. Yeah, because like, it's not like you can put Kipper out there for 40 games this year just due to how ridiculous parts of the schedule are like in february i think we play like t uh 12 games like every other night like with like only like one extra day off in that whole stretch so you know like you're going to need another goalie for at least you know 15 games because there's just way too many games in too short of a time period Personally, I can see both Carlson and Irving getting starts this year. I think Carlson will be the backup, the guy who rides the pine, and I think Irving will be brought in for those games when Carlson's just not looking good or feels he needs a break. So I think we're going to see three goalies rotated in and out this year. I don't see that happening. I could see it. Uh, just uh, It depends on like if Carlson performs badly, then Irving would get the shot. But it just depends, really, on who does what. Truthfully, I 
if Irving doesn't win this job out of camp, I'm I don't see any way he doesn't get waived. And if someone claims him good, that's a contract off our books. But, I mean, this is a guy who, you know, interest was so high in him on him that, you know, didn't get a, any offers. No no one wanted to trade for him, even a seventh, if they thought he could be anything. The opinion of Leland Irving league-wide cannot be very high. So if you lose him, you lose him. Everyone, any, if he turns into something else, you know, great. But I think it's pretty obvious at this point, whatever he becomes is probably not gonna happen for him in calgary he's been around this organization long enough i think we know we've got in him he's not a wild card anymore where we could lose him and not know we've got Mm -hmm. well i mean he is just in the sense that every goalie is like that um which is why it's silly when people you know people like to talk about oh we drafted trevor kidd instead of martin broder there's no guarantee that martin broder doesn't play in front of some awful Calgary teams for a couple years and do nothing and just fades into the obscurity of Trevor Kidd. True. But that can happen with goalies. That can happen with anybody, too. I mean, we got rid of Martin San Louis. Well, like even uh, Patrick Waugh, when he was drafted, I think he was like the fourth or fifth goalie drafted that year. And it was just a bit of a fluke that he got the both the Canadians goalies got hurt right before the playoffs. And he got thrown in there. Like if he if that didn't happen, perhaps you know he doesn't become Patrick Waugh. <laughs> it just depends. We've also seen the other side too, where bad goaltenders like Freddie Brathwaite have come in and had an exceptional season when they've needed to have an exceptional season. Contract years are a beautiful thing. I mean, exceptional is relative for Freddie Brathwaite, but at the time, that's what the Flames needed in a goaltender. And he performed, and we actually were able to flip him in a trade because he performed. Yeah, well, trying to determine goaltenders is like trying to herd cats. <laughs> it, you know, it's going to be a little random. <laughs> so with a shortened season this year, do you guys think it's going to help or hurt the Flames? I mean, there's a team that's known to get a slow start, so do you think we see the Flames that normally start a season or the Flames that normally end a season? Oh my god, I have, you know... Uh, I have no idea. See, again, Calgary, this is what you've co- you should expect. Ballsy predictions. I have no idea. Yeah, it really... It's hard to say. Like, it, you can kind of envision both things happening, and with confidence that, yeah, that could that makes sense. So, it just really depends. Matt, do you think that uh, we're going to see the Flames using any of their amnesty bios that they're allowed starting next summer? If Stajan performs badly, then possibly, but other than Stajan, I don't really see any point in doing that. Everybody says that Sutter was such an awful management of management guy for salary cap in the roster, but if you look around the league, we're sitting pretty good as far as bad contracts go. Yeah, like when Stajan's the only bad one, and it really it just depends on what Stajan you're getting. You know, like, that's a pretty good position to be in. It's it's nothing like Montreal where you got Scott Gomez and Caberlet and Brandon Prust. And, you know, like, let's pick which bad contract to get rid of. <laughs> you didn't answer the previous question. Do you think the Flames are going to be helped or hurt by the short season, Matt? Uh, I think that you could see either. Um, I think that they'll end up being helped just because... Perhaps, like, a Genla might not have a fast start, but the guys that were in Europe, like Hoodler and Cervenka, or in on the farm team, like uh, Berchi, I think those guys will be, you know, ready to go. And, you know, I think they could have a good show of it right off the bat. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I really think that we have enough guys that have played hockey recently that we're not going to have a problem with that yeah like it's not like they were all couch cases for the entire lockout so um i could see this schedule really hurting them given how fragile uh our top guys have been the last couple years uh cam larry hasn't played a full season in i think two years tangay missed significant time last year 
Iginla is a year older, and once again, he's got a groin injury, which Hartley says if, he, if there was a game tonight, he'd play, but who knows. Um, I think there is enough, uh, I guess, there's talent enough for them to be successful, but a lot of guys are have injury concerns, and if any of the top guys go down for any length of time, I think the team flounders. I think any team flounders this year, though, if their top guys get hurt. There's not enough time to to bring somebody else in. There's not enough free agents to bring somebody else in. Exactly. I'm really going out on a limb. Well, at the same time, uh, you were saying you think this is the strongest team we've had in a while, and I would tend to agree with you, and I think there's enough depth that for a short-term injury, a couple weeks, we can work around those big guys being out. Yeah, because we definitely have a top nine that's fairly solid one through nine. So, uh, you know, like if we lose, say, Tange or Ginla for two weeks, you know, like the, those guys are still good. And then you still have guys like Stempniak and Como that are on the fourth line that can do a decent job if they're put up onto the third line. So, you know, it, it's not like last year where you had you were required to have a Stempniak and Como on the second line just due to the lack of depth. Yeah, I think as long as we're not talking months or, you know, more than, say, four weeks of an injury, I think we can cover the holes fairly well. The only guy I'm worried about is if Kipper gets hurt. Yeah, well, anytime any team gets their starting goaltender out for an extended period of time, they're going to have a really tough time unless they have a quality backup which we don't have so you know <laughs> it just depends on well hopefully kipper doesn't get hurt with the season starting i'm expecting two major rumors to start again the first one is the jay bowmeister trade rumors and the second one is the jerome mcginla trade rumors we've heard them for years do you guys think either one of them finally happened this year bowmeister is not going to be traded because there's only really two ways things can go for him. He's either going to continue to be the disappointment that he has been, in which case no one will want him, or he's going to have a renaissance and be the guy we thought we were getting three years ago, in which case we're not going to want to trade him. So either way, I think he finishes his he finishes the year with the Flames, and if he's still a bum at the end of the year, he'll, he might be bought out, he might not be, but... Uh, He's not getting traded, I don't think, because no, no one that we would acquire for him would be worth giving up Bowmeister just for the sake of getting rid of him. It's bad asset management. If Aginla doesn't get signed in, like, the next month, then yes, I could see, you know, if the Flames are out of it, I could see them trading him, because it's better to get something than nothing. Um, with Bo Meester, honestly, unless you're giving him away, I don't see anybody wanting to take on seven, nearly $7 million for someone that's a 2-3 guy. Especially with the cap going down next year. Yeah. I've always been a fan of Jerome's. I think he's a great uh, player on the ice. I mean, yes, he's aging, but every player ages. I think he's good at what he does. I think he's a good leader on and off the ice for this team, and I really don't want to see him go anywhere because I'm not sure who would fill in some of those voids, some of those kind of soft voids, like being that team leader in the dressing room and the team leader off the ice. Someone always steps up. I mean, that's the nature of sport. I mean, if there's a void the most capable guy in the room, you know, fills it. And now you're right that we don't have an heir apparent to him, but... Yeah, like, Berchi might be able to fill the void uh, in a couple of years once, like, he establishes himself. But, like, if they were to get rid of him, like, Camilleri could t probably take over in the interim... Yeah, I was going to say, I think Cammy gets the C if Jerome leaves. Yeah, I could... Yeah, it would be between him or Giordano. The, that would be my two picks. As a Jerome McGinley fan, I want to see him stay in Calgary, but I don't want to see him stay in Calgary at $7 million. I'd like to see him come back for three, maybe four, um, on a one-year-by-one-year one deal, so just re-up him every summer. I think uh, five and a half, six million dollars... It, you know, it, 
you gotta find what their both sides are willing to go. Seven, I agree, is too high, but you know, if it it requires a two or three year deal, I'm perfectly fine with that. So you know, it just depends on what each side is willing to work with. Uh, no, nothing more than three years. Um, and honestly, I'd be fine with two at uh, two at twelve is fine. He's signed deals like this before. Uh, there's been at least one or two contracts which were uh, big six point five seven million dollar two three year deals. Um, Flames have been very good to Jerome, and if he wants to stay here, he should take less term because I wouldn't say he owes it to them, but there, there is sort of a, an understanding, and he's been very well taken care of, and he's 35. He's going to be 36 by the time he needs to sign his next contract, and which will mean he's on the books for as long as the contract exists. So uh, circumstances being what they are, three years max. Now, if he were 34, then fine, give him a five-year deal. But as long as it's on the books forever or for the duration of the contract, you can't you can't go nuts with term. Well, plus with Aginla, I don't see him being the type of player that gets broken down and, you know, irrelevant by 39. Like, I could easily see him playing till he's 42 or 43, like Timu Solani. But, you know, you don't want to have a contract like that on the books just in case <laughs> he does ha- face injury problems down the road. Yeah, I agree, man. Mm-hmm. And Timu Solani, Timu Solani, for all the success he has, and he's he's a marvel, Timu Solani has never, in his since he's gone back to the Ducks, been paid as though he's the front-line option. Timu Solani is a is, is an amazing piece to have in your second line, maybe first power play, whatever. But he is not, by any stretch of the imagination, the strongest. No, the he's drink, a good second, he. top end second line player, and like again, eventually will be that in a couple of years. Right now, he's still good enough to be the first line right winger. But yeah, he, I agree. He shouldn't be paid as you know the top tier free agent like a Parise or whatever. (laughs) Oh, uh, I noticed in the show notes you had uh, uh, should the Flames have gone after Suter and Parise, and now that you've brought up, Matt's brought up Parise, can I I just, there's something I want to mention about all the crazy contracts we saw signed towards the end of the CBA. Sure. Um, Does anyone remember when the point of those super long-term contracts was to actually circumvent the salary cap? Like, Everyone mocks Rick DiPietro. Rick DiPietro's cap hit is four and a half million dollars. Mike Richards' cap hit is five million and change. Ditto for Jeff Carter. Marion Hosa and Roberto Luongo making less than uh, than six million dollars on their cap hit. Um, and then Ilya Kovalchuk gets a deal where it's like whatever six point six, and Suter and Parise get. 13-year deals where their cap hits are $7.8 million. What's the point of that? What was what was accomplished, other than acquiring two players that will revitalize your franchise, I understand that. But why, like, simply on the basis that there is no cap circumvention in the Suter and Parise contracts. Well, realistically, like, if they were to sign, like, a two- or a three-year deal, you would their cap hit more would have been... Like nine, nine and a half, ten million. So I can understand why, like, it's still the same thing. It's just when, like, those earlier contracts were signed, the cap was like 50, 52, 55 million, not like 70 million, which is what it was. So, you know, like, that does make a difference. Yeah, I agree with Matt. I think the league economics have changed, and that changed the economics of those long deals, too. You guys are absolutely correct. I apologize for going on a small tangent. Are you guys happy that the Flames didn't go after Suter or Parise? Yes, if, if it was going to cost 13 years and $98 million to get them. Yeah, I agree. Like, I like Parise, and I thought he would have been a good addition, and he certainly will help the Wild immensely, but... 
you know, for that duration and that high of a cost, I, you know, there too many things can screw up. You know, all it takes is a concussion or two, and then, you know, you're into a dicey situation. So, you know, it's way too much risk on the team and very little risk on the player. So, I, like, look at the Islanders. They're stuck with DiPietro's $4.5 million, and they'll have to pay him a huge, huge amount if they decide to buy him out. Like, that's... You know, ridiculous to me, but... Zach Parise, I'm just noticing, has been a point-per-game player twice. Um, other than that, he is uh, 32, 62, 65, 94, 82, 6, and 69. So, I mean, clearly, I mean, good player. Even in the playoffs last year, 24 games, 15 points. That gets you $98 million now? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's just... Matt, on what you were saying about the risk... On what you were saying about the risk of these guys, I felt the same way with Richards the summer before. I thought, you know, I'd love to see Brad Richards here, but when I saw what it took, money-wise and term-wise, yeah, to no get way. him, I'm oh, glad no, we didn't I, sign I would have been mad if the Flames would have done that for that term. Like, really... I was happy to hear we were in there until the end. The Flames were negotiating and trying, which something we haven't heard for a lot of years. It sounded like we were playing on these guys, but we also knew when to fold our hand and yeah. walk away. Like, really, more than a five-year contract, it's getting a little too dicey. You know, like, it's one thing if the guy's, like, 26 or 27. Like, I think Parise is 26. But, you know, like, it just, it's way too much risk for the team. To the point where, I, you know, it would be better financially to, you know, have a bad couple of years, get some good prospects through the draft, and do it that way instead of having an an possible anchor. So, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, it's going to end up costing the Islanders, like, 30 or 40, 50 million dollars to get rid of Di Pietro if they buy him out. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, especially when they're... That's, like, what yeah, their entire payroll is <laughs> for a season. Like, that's, you know, not fair to the team. I don't see the Islanders buying out Di Pietro, if I'm being honest. I mean... No, neither well, do I. Because that's with just you? too... Well, it's too much. <laughs> Well, I mean, so, there, there's that, but I mean, you don't have to pay him anything. Insurance is pay. I'm sure insurance is paying for most of his contract. Although, because it's a 15 year, I don't know. I'm sure someone. At the same time, they have an they have an option for an amnesty buyout next summer, and that's the only reason I think they may end up buying. Yeah, but we, it's right. going to cost them a ton of money. And since you know, you can either have him sit on your roster and insurance pay him and you have his cap hit or not as the case may be if with long-term injury um until they start having a little bit more financial success i don't see how they can even afford to buy him out i think charles wong might just want to pay it out up front and be done with the contract well he did do that before the ashen so who knows <laughs> Especially with them moving to a new arena and all that sort of thing, he might be trying to get his financial ducks in a row. The with difference that team. is, though, I don't think he liked Yashin. I think he felt really who, betrayed that. Uh, who does like Yashin? Like, really? <laughs> I'm sure his mom is fond of him, but he's yeah, Russian, yeah, yeah. so they they may not. You know, <laughs> they're different over there. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, anything else about the Flames you guys want to talk about before we wrap this thing the up? Flames. Um, what do you guys think of the opening of our schedule? We open on the 20th against the Sharks at 4 p.m. And we play back-to-backs at home, which I think is good, against the Sharks and the Ducks. January is really a slow month. We've got the Canucks, the Oilers, and the Avalanche in there. And February is really going to be a crazy month. I think Matt said earlier, we're playing almost every other yeah. day. Oh, it's good that they're hitting the, the road running right off the bat with a back-to-back. Because at least they'll get some games under their belt right off the bat and, you know, hopefully prepare them for the fun they'll have in February. And as tough as our schedule looks, everyone's in the same boat, so it's not like we got the short end of the stick here. Yeah. 
One one thing I am glad for is that we only play in Anaheim once, so that's only one guaranteed loss this year. I think we can handle one. <laughs> Do you guys know if Camilleri's going back to 93 this year, if he's staying at 13? No, he's 13. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, Berchi is sticking with 47 for the time being. Whether that changes next uh-huh. year, who knows. There's that quote floating around that uh, he liked how many people, or he was impressed with how many people bought his jersey when he was here for five games last year, and he'd hate to throw them under the bus like that. So, And he likes 47, so I think he's going to be 47 for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think so too. And Bo Meester's not a, a frumpy old hockey guy like Sutter was who wants everyone to wear numbers between 1 and 30. I mean Hartley. Um, no, I meant Feaster, sorry. He's, you know, because often those come from the office, not from the coach. It was, oh, Feaster, yeah, that, it was Feaster that suggested to Camilleri that he should wear 93, so I think he's open to a lot of these kind of experimental and different numbers than we're used to seeing. And speaking of Feaster, uh, I'm thrilled that he's uh, been losing weight over the off season. Because uh, I saw a video of him talking with the Flames players, and he looked like he lost quite a bit of weight. So good for him for making healthy choices. I agree. Speaking of that video, I just wanted to bring it up because I think I saw the same one, Matt. It was on their website, and it's the one where Feaster's doing a dressing room um, ad- address to all the players. I thought as a fan, that's really cool. If if anyone listening hasn't seen it, go to the Flames website on the video section, it's called Feaster Speech, and the subtitle is We Can Write the Future, and I found it really inspiring. I mean, it could just be lip service, but it's pretty much Jay Feaster saying, we don't have time to dwell on the past, everyone's going to write their own future from here on. And I thought it was really interesting they released that to the fans, because normally anything that happens in the dressing room stays there if there's no press in it. Yeah, it, I, th- I thought it was a nice uh, moment for the team, good uh, good thing to release online especially to drop a little more interest which you know couldn't hurt at this with the lockout wiping out half the season as it did but i was struck by just uh how much we could use a little more uh ray lewis types in the nhl just for the speeches i i I don't know how uh you know how fired up some of these guys can get as orators um that's, that's just me. We need Ray Lewis. He's not He's not going to be doing it. He's going to be working with ESPN when he retires. But. Well, more personality can't hurt. Yeah. So. It's better than. I think especially as the NHL is going to be trying to drum up their TV viewership again. I think that they're going to need more personalities yeah, to help n- with that. Definitely not like the FNUF, yep, no type of, you know, very dull interview. <laughs> Oh, one player I'm happy is not a flame anymore, but that's neither here nor there. I'm going to put you on the spot a minute here. Um, where do you think the Flames finish in the Northwest Division? I'll go fourth. Uh, well, it, the thing is, is that too many things can go wrong. Like, there's too many ifs on this team. Like, it's just... <sighs> There's too many question marks, and like if you look at the Wild, they have a very solid team top to bottom. You look at the Canucks, they have a solid team top to bottom. The Oilers, as much as we like to make fun of them, they're starting to get a good team top to bottom. The only other team that in our division that's got the similar amount of question marks is the Avalanche. So, it, you know, like, it would be definitely feasible that the flames could win the division like it's not out of the realm of impossibility it's just that there are a lot of things would have to go right in that for that to happen and when you're getting too many ifs and maybes that kind of tends to work itself out into a lower (laughs) seed so i don't see them actually making the playoffs or you know finishing higher than 12th. So you guys don't think that, as much as we said the Flames have a strong roster, we're not expecting a really good season from them? For me, they haven't been a playoff team for three years, so I don't see how we can sit here reasonably and go, well, clearly they've, you know, they're, they're a playoff team. Because um, 
I mean, if do they do, do I think they have it in them to be a playoff team? Sure, absolutely. And I I don't think that uh, they've got the horses to be a top team in the league. But if everything broke their way, I could see them anywhere from six to eight. Because in as much as they aren't a playoff team. They finished ninth the last couple of years, and I think this team is better than the teams that finished ninth. Yeah, it's one of those things where, like, if you say that the Flames finish 15th, you could reasonably say, yeah, that could happen. If the Flames win the division, you could reasonably say, yeah, that could happen. It's one of those things where, it, who knows? <laughs> That there are way too many questions. Yeah, I think marks, this, I think this is an interesting year for the Flames, and they'll be very good or very bad. And I think that's kind of what you guys were saying too. And that I don't think they'll be in the middle. They're either going to have a great season, and we're going to roll the dice, and everything will come up in our favor, or we're going to roll the dice, everything's going to end awful, and we're going to be bottom of the Northwest. It put it this way: if they're not in a playoff spot by like the 20 game mark i really doubt that they'll actually make the playoffs because there's just too little time i think the first couple weeks of this season are going to tell us too i think in order to be a good team and to make top eight in the west we have to come out guns blazing from the beginning i don't think we can start getting our act together halfway through this short season yeah, like they pretty much have to have like a 600 winning percentage by the time the 14th comes around to feel somewhat confident that they'll actually make it. Yeah, I was looking at the schedule today, and to me that cutoff was Valentine's Day. If they're not in there by the about the 14th of February, or at least showing promise to get there, I don't think they're going to make it. If they're stumbling all the way to Valentine's Day, I think this season's a wash. I think this could be a good building season. I think it could be a good season to get the players familiar with a new coaching staff, to get some younger guys in this roster. And if we don't make it, I think it'll definitely get us one step closer to making it next year and we have a full season. Yeah, well, like you're, you'll have a good idea of what Backlund is because I don't think he's had a full threshing out of what he could be. Because, like, you still see flashes of him possibly being a top six player. But, you know, that consistency hasn't been there. So, at least with this year, you'll know what you've got there. And similarly with Berchi, he'll be introduced to the league and you'll know what you've got there as well. And Yeah, I was going to say, even more than Backlund, I'm curious what we've got in Berchi. I mean, we saw him for five games last year and he looked amazing, but I don't think that's how he plays for 48 games or even 82 games in a regular season. Yeah, like, uh, from what what I've seen of Berchi, he seems to have uh, Tange's vision on the ice for seeing people, as well as a very good wrist shot. So you add the two together and you're looking at a possible star player like a Marian Hossa it just it depends on if he actually gets there or not but I could definitely see him being a 30-40 goal guy in the future for sure we've seen this before from guys I mean when David Moss first came up we saw this brilliant flash from him we've seen it from a lot of guys in this organization I, I don't think don't get me wrong I think Berchi's going to be a good player but I don't think he's going to be this automatic um, number one guy on this team. I think that people are overhyping what we've got there. We did the same thing with Backlund. I mean, he came in and everyone thought he was going to be this amazing number one center right away. Except there was nothing really in his past or well, anywhere to indicate that he could be that guy. We just didn't have anyone to get excited about. Um, Berchi, when you watch him play... He is in open space. He knows where to go on the ice. His hockey sense is off the charts. His release is deadly. He has, he is the total package outside of maybe his size. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that in three years, he's the best player on this team, at least homegrown. Um, the David Moss, you know, Guys who just put their head down and muck about and go hard to the net, they'll yeah, they're streaky by definition because their style is not conducive to consistency. They need other people to make things happen for them in order for them to be successful. Sven Berchi makes 
makes his own luck, basically. I mean, he uh, he can skate in this league. He has got the he's he can think it fast enough, and there is no reason whatsoever that he shouldn't tear it up. I hope you're right. Yeah, I mean, guys, don't get me wrong. I'm not down on Berchi. I think he is the future of this team, and especially as we talked about with Jerome becoming like a second or third line player in three years, I just don't know if now is his time. Oh, no. Uh, How would you say you can't really put too much responsibility of you have to be the guy right off the bat? Because even like when you've got teams like when Chicago got uh, Kane and Taze, like they... They put him out there, but it wasn't like, you must do this or we're screwed type of thing. I mean, it sort of was. Like, like there, 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 there was obviously no pressure for them to win a Stanley Cup in their rookie season. And I don't think there's going to be that for Sven. But, I mean, would it shock any of you if he was top five in team scoring at the end of the year? Not at all. But, again, if we're looking at a team that we've all predicted to finish fourth or fifth in the Northwest, top of team scoring could be not that many points okay but top of team scoring is still top five team scoring i mean someone's got to be there like you're not going to lose every game one nothing even if they you know whatever i i yeah, you no, know i i i get what you're saying and i think we are going to see a productive year from barchi i don't think that we're going to see every game like those five games that he came out playing last year which i think some people are expecting from him I think it will be a good year, and I think he'll be up there in team scoring. I think Cervanka could be up there too, but I think that we have to taper our expectations for this year. I think the only thing that is reasonably going to hold him back this year is uh, simply conditioning and the pace. I mean, he's he's 20 years old. Can Is he in shape enough to handle that 48-game condensed schedule and be at his best every night? playing back-to-back a lot of western conference travel okay so so let me ask you guys this top five for berchi yes calder nom for berchi yeah, yeah why not i yeah i think you he think wins got the calder. Yeah. really Me i could well. definitely see him winning it that was I, of course uh, my calder prediction was before i looked at just how many good rookies are going to be here but uh as far as stuff that other rookies have shown me at the NHL level. I mean, Sven's shown just as much, if not more. I mean... Yeah, that's one of those things, like... It, it, you can have any random player come in and be awesome, like Matt Reed did last year, and he was really good. It, you know, it depends, but I of the leading candidates... Like, you can't not have him in the picture. Any other topics you guys want to address before we call this thing? Uh, I mean, we've neglected the D pairs entirely, and that's probably going to be the biggest weakness on this team. Uh, so let's just quickly yeah. go through this, because it's been an hour and 19 now. Sure. So Sorry, people. We won't always go this long. First show, there's a lot to talk about with the new season and the condensed season. I think there's a lot of stuff that's been waiting that we had to discuss right off the bat. Well, Luke, why don't you lead us through what you want to talk about on the deep pairing? All right, deep pairings. Starters, for starters, I don't necessarily know if... Uh, I don't know. I was going to say I don't know if you can have Chris Butler and Derek Smith in the lineup at the same time. And if that were the case, if I would choose Smith... But it seems like Chris Butler's been playing with Weidman in camp, and Giordano's been playing with Bowmeister. Finally, we get our two best D on the ice at the same time, which doesn't seem like a horrible idea. Nashville certainly managed to do it without uh, suffering, and I feel that uh, the school of thought that says you don't want to overstack your D pairing um, makes no sense, and uh, I'm glad we're not doing that anymore. Giordano and Bo Meester should be playing together. Uh, Butler and Weidman should be fine. They're not going to be going. Butler's not going to be going against top guys, so he should be better. And then Smith, Sarage, Brody. Like I, I assume Brody's on this team as a five. I always go back to the fact that he played twenty-five minutes in a nine-nothing loss and was even. And I think that alone 
it, it's not quite worthy of a Norris nomination, but you get a couple more points. You're in the conversation. Um, and from there, like, there's... To me, there's question marks around Sarich, so I think you have to keep Brody on the team to fill in there if Sarich gets hurt again or doesn't have the season he needs well, to I have. Think, I think Brody's your five already. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think any of the other guys, Smith, Babchuk, Sarich, Breen, whoever, or not even, let's leave Breen out of this, but I want to talk about him in a minute. Um, any of Smith, Sarich, or Babchuk uh, bring to the table as much as TJ Brody does. Well, Brody, he could, you could envision him developing into a number one, number two caliber defenseman. So I think you need to give him a spot on the third pairing at least and just let him take it and run with it because you don't know what you've got there. I would be tempted at a certain point in the season if the D is struggling a little bit, change it up, put Brody in top four with Weidman and let Butler and whoever the six is, Sarich, say. Butler is a five or six, doesn't bother me. He's a fine five or six defenseman. Um, he's probably a fine number four. Uh, he's not a two. And he's overmatched physically, uh, mentally, in every foreseeable way on the top pair. He's not a game changer. He is a, you know, bend and hope you don't break sort of guy. Do you guys think there's any chance Steve Beijing makes the team? No. Uh, I wouldn't be entirely shocked, but he'd have to have a really good training camp. Steve Beijing is, as far as I know or as far as I'm concerned, rather, uh, a favor from Jay Feaster. Oh, like, I'm not this... arguing that, but, like, it, how would you say, like, if you he blows you away and outperforms Jackman and the other fourth-liners, you know, you can't just, you know, say, oh, no, because you're Steve Bajan, but... Do you think there's any way he goes to the AHL? No. Yeah, that's where I think he'll end up. But, you know, I, I never write off anybody, you know, because you never know. Sometimes players can have a really good training camp and, you know, win the job. So He's got five days to make an impression. He had, I don't think he played last year. He's in his mid to late 30s. Um he would have to be like twice the player any of Jackman or uh, Winchester Jones or Como would be because simply because of his age and the time he's been off like Theo Fleury had a couple of goals uh, won the shootout and we still cut him now it's a different regime obviously but it, it's very difficult for these older guys to make teams like this and especially a team that the flames like or sorry like the flames that doesn't have a you know it's not like these this is a contending team that needs some veteran leadership for the playoffs get them over the hump or whatever this is just as far as i'm concerned it's a tweener franchise that uh you know needs to is gonna have to make a decision once this season is done um so yeah, I don't see Steve Bajan making this team, and I don't see him in the AHL. I mean, he's only on a professional tryout agreement. Uh, he's he's not on a two-way or anything. So unless he wants to go to the AHL, but I don't see why Feaster. Well, I think would... you could make the argument that the Flames release him from his professional tryout. Abbotsford signs him to a professional tryout. They like him and they sign him. I don't think he's going to take up one of the Flames' fifty roster spots, but I could see him ending up in the AHL on an AHL deal. I mean, maybe, but the pickings are going to have to be pretty slim for the Heat to bring in Steve Bajan. He was also an assistant in Boston in the NHL, so you might look at it as a leadership move in the NHL. He could. I mean, I don't think there... It's not that I don't think there's a role for him in the AHL. I just don't think Steve Bajan wants to do that. I mean, I don't think he played in the AHL last year, did he? I'm not sure. Uh, let's, let's, I think he was. Let's... I think he was hurt last year. Uh, yeah, last time he played hockey of any kind was 2010-2011, and he played two games for the 
Predators and 36 games for the uh, Milwaukee Admirals that year. Yeah. Wow, he's only got 488 games played. He seems like he's been around longer. Um, yeah. I don't... I, I think we can probably all agree he's not a top candidate for a job. He might surprise somebody, but I don't think he's a top candidate for the job by any means. I don't, I don't think he is simply because no one's talking about him. And we're three days into camp, and... Or two days, rather. Uh, and if something was going to happen with him... We'd have heard something by now. He had to make noise right away to knock any of these guys out. And he hasn't done it. So I think uh, he's going to be released in short order. And uh, if he signs on the AHL, that's not really a concern of ours. So, Lucas, anything else about the defenseman you want to go through? Um, Chris Breen. Uh, In my estimation... Chris Breen brings an element that uh, this defense core does not possess. He is a, you know, just big shot-blocking earth mover in front of the net, clear the crease, um, penalty kill specialist at this point in his career. I don't know what his, you know, skating doesn't seem like it's quite NHL ready, but I could see him being, you know, a more physical Hal Gill type for us next year for sure. Um... If not this year, if his play or injuries dictate that he be brought up. Um, I think people overlook him a lot when talking about defensive prospects, but I think he's going to be very valuable for this team going forward. And he looks better than Keith Ollie. I think he's been really solid in the AHL. I think there's a few holes in his game still that, you know, you wouldn't have him in the starting lineup, say, uh, to start the year, but, you know, if, like, say, two of the defensemen get hurt, sure, why not? Um, he definitely, I think, could be, like, the next Adam Party, you know, five, six guy in the future that, you know... Well, let's, let's not, let's not give up on him yet. Well, Party was decent. I agree with Matt, I think he's a He's a good player. He's a good AHL guy. He does have some holes, and I don't think he makes this team out of camp, but I think he's probably on the list of the first couple guys to get called up in an injury. Mm-hmm. And I, the only reason I disagree with the Adam Party comparison is because Adam Party was never anything more than a 6 or 7. Somehow he hoodwinked Dallas into $4 million, but he's got a great agent. Um, Chris Breen, I could see playing... Big minutes at some point in the next couple of years for this oh, team. Oh yeah, I so it, it's that, one of those things with defensemen like that. You don't really know what you're getting until they actually play. So you know, like he could end up eventually just being Adam Party, or he could end up being a top four reliable Robin Regeer light type defenseman. You just it, like with goalies, you don't really know what you're getting until they actually play, and then you go from there. Mm-hmm. He he looks far more composed than Adam Party. His puck skills leave a little bit to be desired at this point, but he, he is in the position to make the right play more often than not. Now, he doesn't always make that play. Sometimes a fan on a pass, get beat, whatever, but he, from what I've seen, is not going to be horrifically out of position a lot of the time so that's you know that's good yeah baby steps why don't we encourage anyone listening that if they see chris breen get called up this year to really take a look at him if they're live at a game where they're not following the camera to really watch him no matter if he's in the play or behind the play and if they're on tv or they see him on youtube to take another moment to look at this guy because i think we all think he's going to be a big flame in the future mm-hmm. yes anyone in abbotsford um if you watch him please tweet me at Luke L U C one seven zero one, and uh, yeah, that'll be fun. I want more Twitter followers. I want people. Is there to... anything else you want to get to before we wrap this thing up? I just want to explain why I'd like more Twitter followers. It's because I need a reason to actually tweet stuff. Um, post lots of stuff on Facebook and whatever. That's fine. Everything I post in Twitter feels like I'm shouting into a void. 
no one ever reads it, and it upsets me. So somebody, please follow me at Luke seventeen oh one. It'll be a good time. And here I don't have either Facebook or Twitter, so <laughs> Matt's the Amish of the group. Yep. Oh boy. We still love him though. Matt, are you talking to us on a computer, or are you on a tin can with a string on it? Tin can, for sure. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yep. <laughs> Matt, anything else you want to bring up before we close this thing? No, I'm good. All right, well, let's uh, sign off. I think it's been a, a great first podcast. I'm looking forward to continuing the fireside chat, and I hope people will join us again, and hope everyone enjoys the flame season for whatever it may be. Whether it's a good season or perhaps not as good a season as we wanted, I think it's just going to be fun to have hockey back on the ice and have this city the vibrant place it usually is during this season again. I think I can probably wrap this up and I'll, Lucas, I'll let you get to your thought after, but it's going to be good to say it again. I think we can all say for once, go Flames, go. Definitely. Do you want us to say it all at once? No, it's okay. Okay, that's... It We're been not awkward. that lame. <laughs> well, I mean... I don't think any of us are in a position to make that judgment. <laughs> we'll see if anyone comes back to listen to us again, then we'll know how lame we are. If anyone shows up at all, in the first place. Well, thanks for joining us for um, the Fireside Chat. This has been Dan, Matt, and Lucas signing off, and we'll see you again next time.